today's talk is something that, uh, that I'm certainly uh, interested in. Uh, and I think it's something the British defence establishment should be interested in as it sort of wrestles and grapples uh, and re-grapples with uh, the notion of what military power is, uh, how it works, uh, how to utilise it, uh, how to deploy it. Uh, and I think this collection of essays uh, will be hopefully instrumental uh, in informing the debate. So the way, the way we're going to do it today, I think, is Greg is going to kick off uh, as the editor, just speak about the rationale uh, behind the book uh, in general, and then, and then talk about his contribution, and then Poppy, uh, and then Geraint will follow on for about 10 minutes each, uh, the speakers, just talking about their own particular aspects of, uh, of how they see this, this particular subject uh, and its, uh, its significance. Um, and then we will open up after about 40 minutes uh, to Q&A. And so those of you watching, if you'd like to use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, to input your questions, and then hopefully I can, I can feed them to the presenters. Um, usual rules apply. So in the interim, if you can uh, mute, your, uh, mute your speakers, uh, your microphone rather, so that uh, we don't get any interference. Um, and with that said, Greg, if you'd like to take it away. Thanks, Chris. Uh, you robbed me of two years of hard time. Oh, 2000 sorry. was the year that I came to the beloved shores here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as Chris indicated, I'm going to give a quick overview of the rationale for the book and then talk about my own chapter. Uh, the book came about in many ways because of what it is that we teach and who our students are here at the Defense Academy. And this was particularly the case um, with my teaching on the higher command and staff course. Uh, if you look at the table of contents for the book, the very last chapter takes us up to, uh, well, basically it takes us up to two years ago. And uh, that chapter was written as part of the coursework by uh, two of the students on <coughs> HCSE, Chaz Kinnett and uh, Ollie Brown, and both are practitioners of that, Ollie out in Kenya, uh, with the British Army, and Chaz involved in Typhoon and the Saudi Arabian connection there with sales of Typhoon to Saudi Arabia. So they were well placed to be able to draw contemporary lessons into what we provided as kind of the historical background. Um, the, the motivation besides the teaching part was, of course, the uh, defense engagement doctrine of 2017 which uh, as part of the curriculum at the Defense Academy in general, we all were obliged to kind of take a look at, and some of us more than others would have had to teach to it or around it or with it. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it struck me that, well, there were a number of very kind of uh, important flaws with this document, and certainly with Ollie and Chaz, my, uh, my time spent was the, with them was trying to convince them that actually what that doctrine was talking about in terms of the role of defense engagement and more importantly the expectations of outcomes was quite off center to what you could really expect uh, defense engagement to do and if you thought about defense engagement more as an attribute of soft power it had a great deal of sophistication and a great deal of complexity and the ability to be used widely in different circumstances but to do things like as was claimed prevent war was problematical to say the least in terms of crafting a, an application. So that was where the catalyst for trying to provide a, a reader in some ways for those that are interested in defense engagement. And it's a topic that it has found other more contemporary commentators, Kev Rollins, who, Rollins who's on, um, a naval captain who's on staff, uh, head of um, ACSC at the moment at the Staff College, his own book on maritime defense engagement, defense diplomacy, is uh, one of the more recent ones that's come out to also augment this kind of area. So as an area of study, and one with which academic tools can be provided, I think it's a rich environment in that way. And I think that the book proves itself to be the case, because you do have a, a cross pollination of history and political science and international relations theory and other types of theory that are invested in the analysis of these kind of things. And uh, so I think a multidisciplinary approach to the concept of defense engagement, uh, deeply rooted in historical case studies, 
is um, a fairly valid way to be able to produce the raw materials that then can be presented to practitioners to validate or vindicate or to indeed uh, test whether or not the beliefs they have at the time of its effectiveness uh, are corro corroborated by historical precedent. The technology aspect, uh, to talk then briefly about my own contribution, is uh, the only contribution in the book to the Navy. Uh, I put my hand up right now and say that it is missing the air domain, as well as the cyber and the space, of course. Um, and therefore, as the only contribution to the, the collection that had to do with um, naval power, uh, it interestingly enough is around technology and technology transfer. And it's a case study that takes place in the uh, middle of the 1930s. And it's particularly apropos, I think, for today's condition in the sense that you have great power competition. And in this circumstance, it's the relationship between Great Britain and Japan with the United States thrown in there for good measure. And one of the things that's a problem, much like today, when you think about British and American relations with regard to China, is that the United States and Great Britain in the 1930s, well, at least to the mid-1930s, have varying differing, different views about how to approach and just exactly how much and what kind of a problem Japan is. And on the British side, there is definitely a historical legacy of cooperation, collaboration, and even in alignment through the Anglo-Japanese uh, Treaty of 1902, which is then disband or dis dissolved with the Washington Naval Conference in 1922. So the, the relationship building here and the attempt to try and, and create better relations in the midst of what has become a, a more fractured relationship between Great Britain and Japan is uh, usually viewed as being one of preparation for war by the Royal Navy and not one uh, of overly of engagement. And what you get in 1934 is a, an opportunity. And in many ways, defense engagement, successful defense engagement, is the ability to recognize and seize the right tools to be able to exploit an opportunity. And in 1934, there's a typhoon that destroys a couple of Japanese destroyers. And what the, the, the issue that arises from that is, is that then the Japanese, Imperial Japanese Navy has a, a crisis of confidence in its procurement and construction capabilities, because it's quite embarrassing, these are new destroyers that capsize and sink with a, a high loss of life. So in the midst of what has grown out from 1934 with the Ahmad Declaration where Japan is basically declaring a greater control over China and all things to do with, with the Asia Pacific, which has created a, a higher sense of tension. This opportunity comes up when the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy approaches the Royal Navy and basically asks, how do you do quality assurance for your naval construction programs, and in particular, this type of vessel? So into the diplomatic uh, process goes this request, and, and this is now a combination of the Royal Navy as a major part of government, uh, something that probably is, is um, a bit different to the relationship of the, the, the uh, MOD to government today, and of course, the primacy of diplomacy being able to use and utilize this opportunity to be able to create goodwill. Long story short is through a number of, of methods of engagement, both the Foreign Office and the Royal Navy decide that it is good to share this technical expertise and knowledge with the Imperial Japanese Navy in order to create closer links and to create obviously a sense of, um, of of a, a, a closer relationship built on on this one episode and a return to what had previously been close relations between the navies because these had had drifted apart over the years so indeed the royal navy does give these uh, detailed uh, processes and information about how to do quality assurance and quality management of construction and procurement for its shipbuilding which the japanese gratefully receive now, I mentioned the Americans in here because this is one of the issues in terms of, at the time, the United States not being favorable to such kinds of, of relationship building processes between Great Britain and Japan because of the fear that Japan or Great Britain is appeasing or indeed trying to be closer to Japan than the United States would like and therefore 
may not be aligned as closely with American ideas about how to contain, deter, coerce Japan on a range of issues. So there's a balancing here between a close ally, the United States, and the need for a, a individual national security objective. And that's the, an interesting part of the story. But the resulting outcome is the lesson really of the utility of defense engagement and actual activities within the military domain only. Is it of course, by 1936, when this material had been handed over and visits had been made and the Japanese have now consumed this uh, technical advice and bettered their own systems, well, it didn't matter. At the end of the day, the ideas and the concepts around how this would create closer individual links, it would create organizational links, it would be a beacon around which perhaps even higher, greater strategic sorts of collaboration or at least shows of goodwill could create a different uh, strategic environment. They fell to naught because the political environment at that time, particularly within the Japanese uh, ruling elite, didn't care that this technological kind of transfer had taken place. They would use it, accept it, but it didn't change the price of fish whatsoever about their national security objectives, which was of course to grow Japanese influence and power in the region. So really my chapter is a tale of the limits of such activities. And indeed, like many arms sales or arms trans technology transfers, you never know what might happen to the technology you share with others in a, a time and a space where the belief is that you will end up being uh, able to reap positive rewards, but actually over time and not very much time over the you know, course of just a couple of years, all of a sudden you find that actually the, intellig the technology and the capabilities that you've shared are now actually staring at you um, across the table in a not friendly fashion whatsoever. And you can see where Japanese uh, construction methods do improve after this time. But of course, those ships will be better ships that will find their way into the order of battle against both the Royal Navy and the United States Navy in the not too distant future. So limitations of expectations and limitations of engagement as to what it is you think you're going to be offering and just exactly where the final outcome would lie in terms of the investment you make is uh, what my chapter illustrates in terms of the utility of defense engagement in that condition. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for that, Greg. Um, I think uh, Poppy, uh, are you up next? I think so, yeah. Brilliant. Um, great. So my chapter then in the book um, focuses on Kenya in the, the decades after its independence in 1963, so the 1960s up to the, the early 1980s and particularly the role of the British defense advisors in this relationship uh, with Kenya. Um, and the, the sort of departure point for, for me in thinking about this was Greg uh, sent round where, when we were thinking about this, this um, the document he's already mentioned, the International Defense Engagement Strategy from uh, 2017. And what really struck me in reading this is that a lot of it's presented as being very new. This is a new strategy but it, it actually seemed incredibly familiar to me in terms of a lot of the things that they were talking about. So promoting prosperity, capacity building, um, developing understanding and access and influence. These were all things that I really recognized from um, my working in Kenya at this time. Um, so that's, that's sort of um, part of, of my chapter is really pulling out actually how these things have worked in a, in a historical context. So the, um, the chapter really um, sort of starts with independence in Kenya in 1963. And at that time, Kenya has a British, um, well, sorry, it has a, a colonial military, uh, an army. Um, and it has uh, British leaders of the military. Um, so there's a British commander of the army until 1966 the Navy until 1972, and the Air Force until 1973. And this is really unusual that these continue for such a long time. And Kenya is also important in the 1960s for Britain, um, strategically as part of the, the East 
Suez role, it's Western aligned in the Cold War, um, and there's also an interest in protecting the white European population in Kenya, um, including with kind of military secret plans to protect them if need be. Um, and so the, the result of this is a memorandum of intention and understanding in 1964, which really sets up these key benefits. Um, the British get things like overflying and air staging rights and the right to train in Kenya. While the Kenyans get considerable finance and equipment, including a lot of fixed assets that the British had built up over their colonial history. Um, and also the British offer uh, a training team in Kenya and places on courses in Britain. And there's a real exchange of benefits here. Um, the British military get quite a lot from this, certainly in comparison to most of their colonies in Africa, but they have to also give quite a lot in order to get that. Um, so in terms of, of some of these, these exchange of benefits, training was a really crucial way that the British tried to gain influence in the Kenyan military. Um, the Soviet Union was also making some offers and did do some training for Kenya, but very quickly Britain was the main training partner, establishing a training team that was permanently stationed in Kenya until the 1970s. And this um, made uh, the training in, in Kenya very much British-led um, throughout the first decade and therefore um, sort of further on as well. And there was also a lot of uh, Kenyans who went to training courses in Britain. And until about 1980, this was the, the main place Kenya looked for training. And this also um, fed into the fact that Britain remained Kenya's major arms supplier after independence, providing a lot of equipment as well as a lot of military aid. And these two things are really interconnected as part of this longer term relationship. Arms would require training and training would also encourage buying British arms. So they're, they're very interconnected at this point. Um, and this really encouraged this kind of extended relationship and Britain provided a lot of both for Kenya. And what they're, what they're getting from this, the, the reason why Kenya becomes so important is that British troops are allowed to train there. And this was really rare among their former African colonies. Unlike say France, which had a lot of agreements for this, uh, the British did not have, have many. Um, and Kenya was, um, it offered various climactic conditions that were useful. And particularly after leaving east of, the East of Suez role, uh, it was one of few um, comparable facilities. And just as one example, in thinking about their training for 1979 to 80, there were 10 exercises planned overseas and six of them are in Kenya. So it's really the centerpiece at this point of overseas training. Um, and it's also particularly valuable because of the British Army training liaison staff that set up in 1971. And this is a small staff that remains stationed in Kenya alongside equipment and vehicles. So training becomes much, um, much less expensive. There's le less transportation costs and things much easier and more permanent. And there was the potential for criticism with this training, criticism of why are British troops training in Kenya, of neo-colonialism and so on. So there were attempts to mitigate this um, using joint training quite a lot and um, exercises by the Royal Engineers, building bridges, medical um, support and so on that helped kind of um, make the training seem more palatable to the Kenyan public. But the Kenyan government notably remained very happy to continue hosting such training. Um, and they really raised no objections to training, even th when this was a lot more than the two yearly exercises that were initially um, set up. And then the other area that, um, that I, I really focus on in the book is this about 
um, advice and influence. Before independence, of course, there were no need for, for these kind of roles. And when um, the, the Kenya, Kenya was initially independent, there were so many military officers, military commanders, that they really had a lot of access and influence. They were, they were leading the, the military. Um, and this really gave uh, the British defense advisors who were stationed there a lot of access to um, understanding the leading figures in Kenya's military, to understanding its training, its processes, um, and its equipment, its abilities, and so on. So their, their reports at this time are incredibly detailed about the military readiness and training of Kenya's armed forces, and they, they know this very well. And this really remains until the late 1970s. I mean, just to give one example of, you know, even 15 years after independence, how, how strong this relationship was. Um, in 1978, the, Kenya had ordered a lot of new equipment and really struggled with actually absorbing all of this. They sort of ordered more than they had the capacity to absorb. And the British Defence Advisor set up a military assistance program to help Kenya advise it. And he uh, informally was asked by what he called a charming brigadier um, who's been appointed um, chief of logistics and asking if uh, the defense advisor could brief him on what his duties would be in this. So looking to the British defense advisor rather than his own military for an understanding of this new role. And this defense advisor was also invited to draft the charters for the chief of general staff and the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Defense. So again, he's very much being asked to shape uh, these military roles. Um, and partly this is because of the, the, the slow Africanization process before independence so that there hadn't been a lot of time to build up huge expertise. Um, but it also really speaks to the level of trust that the Kenyan military placed in the British Defence Advisor. This uh, level of influence didn't really last through the 1980s and it, it quite quickly started to decline. Um, as one that the new Defence Advisor said, you know, we now have to make appointments with the de de Department of Defence and we never used to. Um, so the, there is a shift and the informal uh, nature of this relationship does begin to decline in the early 1980s. Partly this is because America becomes much more significant as a partner for Kenya. And there's also a growth in the number of defense advisors in Kenya, which means they get treated much more formally as a group and this informality which had, which had characterized the earlier relations, uh, sort of declines quite a lot. Um, yeah, so, so the, the kind of low point of that is 1983, when the defense advisor cannot comment on the effectiveness of the army because he hadn't been allowed to see any, any training, hadn't been into the camps. So it's a hugely different position. Um, to when Britain was, was the British were, were largely doing the training and the defense advisor could, could have pretty uh, wide access. Um, nonetheless, at the same time as, as commenting this, this defense advisor pointed out that Britain was still really getting a lot from Kenya. There were staging facilities for the RAF, mooring facilities for the Royal Navy and training for the army. So even though they weren't as close, it was still really worth, in his, idea, in his view, investing in the relationship. And obviously, this has continued to be, be true in many ways that the, the British army continues to train in Kenya. And so, the, um, as I've sort of suggested then, the priorities of defence engagement from 2017 actually have a much longer history. Things like capacity building with training relationships, with defense sales, friendly personal relations and advice and influence 
all come out really strongly in this, this period of post-colonial Kenyan British military relations. Thank you. Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Poppy. <clears throat> and, uh, and so to the last of our contributors, uh, Geraint, who I think is going to talk to us about Anglo-Egyptian uh, relations being mediated through defence engagement. Thank you, Chris, and um, thank you, Greg, and uh, uh, thank you, Poppy. Um, what I was looking at really focuses on the <coughs> period from 1967 to 1973 involving the relationship that uh, the defence of Hachette and his team in the British Embassy in Cairo established with the Egyptian Armed Forces. And this was an offshoot of a piece that I did a few years back, uh, quite a long while well back, I think, on um, the Yom Kippur War and its impact on Anglo-American relations, where I'd come across the Cairo Embassy's reports, uh, not just from the, the ambassador, but also from the, uh, the military attaché there. Now, this is a, quite an interesting period for me, because this was a period of rapprochement between Egypt and Britain. This had, yeah, the relationship, uh, certainly after, well, the relationship had always been strained as a result of the um, somewhat laughably ill-named temporary occupation of uh, Egypt and the Canal Zone from 1882 to 1954. But obviously with Nasser and with the Suez crisis and with the rivalry between Egypt and Britain over their respective spheres of influence um, in the Arab world, this meant that you, know, you saw a fundamental transition from that state of hostility to one where um, there is a restoration of amicable relations and the beginning of the, the re-establishment of defence ties that had been lost when uh, Nasser had, uh, and the his uh, counterparts had seized power in the 19, uh, uh, of 1952. So what, um, perhaps a caveat here I should add, most of what, practically all of what I'm doing looks at this from the British side. There is an Egyptian side of this story, which I have not covered. And actually also there is another aspect here in terms of the, whilst you see the establishments of this defence relationship between Egypt and Britain, you see the collapse of the one that Egypt had with its former superpower patron, the Soviet Union. So in a sense, this burgeoning success in defence diplomacy is accompanied by a colossal failure on the part of a rival. Now it matters to me because I have a bit of interest in how um, the United Kingdom pursued its interests in the Arab world uh, and actually, uh, actually in, the, you know, in North Africa, the Middle East more generally after the East of Suez withdrawals from 1968 to 1971. So we still have the same interests but we do not have the same leverage and the same tools of power that were, uh, came from having a formal military presence, particularly in the Persian Gulf, and also a um, senior foreign, uh, foreign Commonwealth Office official there to essentially oversee regional interests and our ties with our former protectorates, with Bahrain, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, and Oman. So if you, are, if you don't actually have the, uh, the formal tools of military power, how do you make the best of what you've got? And defense diplomacy and arms transfers a military to military ties become a way of trying to keep this relationship going. And I think it's also interesting because the fact that, yeah, that this, is, this is a case of re-establishing a relationship with a former, with a former enemy, of using defence diplomacy to try and overcome you know, you know, uh, decades of hostility and mutual suspicion. And we have plenty of examples of how Britain's relations with states have collapsed over the course of the collapse of its influence. But this is an example where there's actually a recovery um, in terms of uh, its influence uh, with a, with a, a um, quite an, a, a significant uh, military and political power in the Arab world. The starting point, um, it, there is the resumption of diplomatic relations in November 1967 after a two-year hiatus. And there, you know, the, the um, embassy does get a, an attaché team headed by a British Army colonel. Initially, it consists just of a, a Royal Navy attaché um, a commander from the, from the Navy, and then a wing commander from the Royal Air Force joins as the air attaché. Things start to change after September, October 1970, when Nasser dies and the uh, vice president, uh, Anwar al-Sadat, uh, becomes president. But the assumption is that he is um, very much a sort of a, a transitory figure. He's dismissed as a sort of a stopgap measure, but he has his own agenda and his own views. And one of them is to break ties with the Soviet Union, which he now sees as unsatisfactory, and to uh, establish um, a relationship with the United States. Because his argument is that the Russians could give me arms, but only the United States can give me what I really want, which is a peace deal with Israel, which reverses the outcome of the Six Day War, reopens the Suez Canal and returns the Sinai to me. So in a sense, actually, you know, the previous that 
they, the, the Egyptians don't have diplomatic relations with the Americans, but if you don't have a relationship with the Americans, you go to the next best option, which in this case is the British. So one of the turning points here is uh, in July 1971, when the uh, naval attaché, Commander John Marriott, receives an invitation from the Egyptian chief of the armed forces, Major General Saad al-Shazli. Now, given the fact that up until that point, attachés had been more or less confined to Cairo and Alexandria and had been constantly being shadowed by the Egyptian Mukhabarat, the uh, internal security police, this was quite an a, 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 um, interesting change. And Marriott was very well received by uh, Shazli, who told him that he wanted to see the um, restrictions imposed on the, the attachés removed and that he also wanted to see Egypt buy British kit, not being reliant on Soviet and Soviet bloc kit as they've been up until that point. So you see the starting point here, which is where actually the, you know, the, the, there's the beginning of an Egyptian uh, British military relationship. Uh, the head of the, the, the chief of naval oper uh, operations, uh, Major, uh, sorry, uh, Admiral uh, Ashraf uh, Mohammed Rufat, is invited to uh, the Royal Navy Expe uh, Exhibition at Greenwich and is also invited to the Royal Navy College. He accepts it. It's the first big Egyptian military mission visiting Britain since 1956. A year after, or about about a year after that Shazley meets Marriott, Sadat announces the expulsion of the Soviet military presence. So all the advisors, uh, the autonomous military units that have been sent there uh, in the aftermath of the Six Day War to bolster Egyptian defense, so that sends them all packing. And this is, you know, gets, you know, gets the attention of uh, the British government, particularly of the Prime Minister Edward Heath and the Foreign Secretary uh, Sir Alex Douglas Hume. And their argument is, if the Russians are going, we now have a golden opportunity to reinforce this growing relationship we have with the Egyptians, given their influence in the Arab world, given their position of leadership. This is, you know, this is a great opportunity to capitalise on. And this is an attitude that the, 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 the attaches themselves have. They have the, the three attaches at this time, Colonel Tony Lewis, uh, John Marriott, uh, Wing Commander David Barnacote, the, the RAF officer, they are at the forefront of pushing for re-establishment of the defence ties, defence sales, sending Egyptians onto uh, UK military courses. They're pushing this and they are very, very keen to see it develop. There are, however, some problems. The Chiefs of Staff attitude back in London is that the problem we get is there's an, yeah, there's an intelligence side here. Even if the Russians are going, the chances are that over the course of time, their intelligence services, the KGB and the GRU, military intelligence, they must have recruited some agents on the ground to report to them. They must have recruited and stormed Egyptians. So if we sell them advanced weaponry, then that's a security risk. And a further problem here involves the Arab-Israeli aspect. The British do not want to do anything that can provoke the resumption of hostilities because like you can see an array of nasty things happening ranging from an oil embargo or to, to a superpower uh, standoff as the United States and the Soviet Union back their respective partners so the other point here of course is that if the British are seen to sell weaponry that emboldens the Egyptians to resume hostilities that's going to have implications for the Anglo-American special relationship as well so part of the problem here is though that although the attaches are advocates for arms sales the problem is that the Egyptians want stuff that the British are not prepared to sell, in particular the Jaguar uh, ground attack aircraft, which has the range to strike targets in Israel. So whilst there is you know, the beginning of the process, in practice, there are a lot of constraints on the extent to which the British can provide equipment to the Egyptians. There are two deals that are in place for the Rapier short range uh, surface to air missile system, and also the um, Sea King anti-submarine warfare helicopter, but these then get cancelled after the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War, when the Heath government announces a complete arms embargo and sales to all belligerents. So as an overall conclusion here, I think it's an interesting point of view to say that, you know, they, they are, firstly, there appears to have been genuinely goodwill on the part of the Egyptians, and a genuine willingness to forgive and forget, and to establish closer ties with the British and to put all the baggage of the past behind them. And there were opportunities in this respect to try and rebuild that relationship. But there were a lot of practical constraints and the Anglo-American aspect in this regard was quite substantial. In fact, the irony is that once the main constraints to British arms sales is removed, when Egypt signs a peace deal with Israel, 
it then means that the Americans then become the main arms suppliers to the Egyptian army because they obviously know that that kit will not be used against Israel. So they then become the main suppliers of weaponry to the Egyptian armed forces. So that, that window of opportunity was very, very narrow indeed. For the British. And it didn't really, and by the time the opportunity was there to exploit it, Uncle Sam effectively steps in. So that in short is what I've hoped I've contributed to this volume. Because I thought it'd be interesting to look at an example of the constraints of using defense diplomacy as a way of uh, affecting essentially a reconciliation with a former foe. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> well, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much to the, uh, the three contributors. I think, uh, from my perspective, a, a pretty sort of uh, balanced um, offering in that sense. I think Greg and his description of the, the Anglo-Japanese naval relationship and local initiatives by the Royal Navy uh, to cooperate with its, uh, its Japanese brethren in that respect um, undermined by broader sort of broader strategic climate and, and broader strategic failings and then conversely I think Poppy showing how you know the uh, avenues of defense engagement really cementing the relationship between Britain and a, and a newly and increasingly independent uh, Kenya although slightly time sensitive I think uh, 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 as it goes on and then and then Geraint a sort of a, a half and half really um, the way in which the the British defence engagement initiatives provide a key avenue of approach to Egypt at this very difficult time, but the way in which a sort of the macro strategic climate prevents that relationship from flowering necessarily as both sides would want, one side in terms of arms supplies uh, and the other side obviously is the, the recipient of those, that being one of, the, one of the key tensions and Britain having to be very mindful of its alliances uh, in the region in the form of Israel. Um, so from that point of view, to, you know, to my mind, genuinely, and I think potentially then if that's representative of the, of the sort of range of offerings in the book as a whole, uh, you know, across all of the contributions, I think, you know, that's a hugely nuanced sort of uh, set of examples as to how this functions in the, in the real world um, and how governments benefit or indeed fail to benefit from the use of, uh, of when we say military power in a, in a sort of an indirect and rather oblique form in, in furthering national national interest um, <clears throat> so i mean it falls to me in the absence of any questions as far as i can tell uh, having having been asked um, i suppose i have a few for the panel and, and 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 feel free to answer in any in any order you like and cards on the table uh, i wrote uh, a sort of uh, and i say it's an article it's more of a, a blog piece uh, uh, a couple of months ago in the, in the Wavell Room, which I think Geraint's already aware of, which was um, fairly sceptical uh, of this, this notion of, of, of soft power as, um, as, a, as an easily wieldable uh, method of, uh, of national influence in, in the sense that, for example, I noted in uh, earlier this year, Penny Morden, a former um, Defence Secretary and former former Minister Minister in, in, in charge of DFID gave a speech at Chatham House on Britain's soft power potential going forwards, and and not at one point in the hour long speech did she mention Britain's military. Uh, Rusi in June, uh, talking about Britain's soft power future, at no point in that report did it mention the military. One one area where I did see the military mentioned was in a parliamentary report on uh, persuasion and power in the, uh, in the modern world, uh, which took the British defence engagement in Myanmar in 2014 as, uh, as an example of how well this sort of thing can work in practice in allowing a, a, a regime military to transition to being good actors, uh, as it were. And of course, what we see afterwards is an attempted genocide of the Rohingya at the hands of the very same military that the British sought to to train and so my question to I suppose to Greg then as the editor I mean you, you you spoke I think you speak in the book of understanding power in the round in a sense and defense engagement being part of this as as part of the articulation of, uh, of national national power and, and I suppose my question is I know the military British military establishment is very keen to talk about power in the sense of narratives and audiences and influence and information and the delicate adjustment of sort of political realities and sentiments and everyone's talking that language 
And you can see where things like defense engagement and soft power fit into that in a theoretical sense. But do you get the sense that the government understands what soft power is, what it means, and more importantly, where, where the military or militaries fit into this? Um, on the first part, I mean, I think the, the standard assessment here of soft power has got to do with things like Oxford and Cambridge road scholarships, exporting of values and ethics, uh, the BBC, all that kind of the traditional tools of the trade. In terms of the understanding of the military and that the military could be anything other than, than hard power, absolutely not. I mean, the, the level of sophistication of the understanding of the application of military power here by governments, this one previous, is uh, not complex, nor is it overly well thought out. So I think that within perhaps the, and this is why, this is why you see many of the initiatives that are like defense engagement are derived and driven by the actual practitioners, the MOD themselves, trying to educate up. Uh, part of it also is a, a, a make a job for yourself. I mean, I don't think it'll come as any surprise that under the pressure of the budgets and the cuts and all the rest of it, that the army is trying desperately to make sure it has a role and a job. And if one of those things, going back to what Poppy in particular is talking about in terms of it, you look now about the talk of moving the tank training and all the stuff out of Canada, now back again into uh, Kenya or other parts of Africa. Yeah, I mean, that is a traditional way to do things. So, no, I, I, you know, the, the whole kind of question about their ability to conceptualize no, because they don't understand what military power is and all of its facets and all of the fashions that it can be actually applied. Um, I'm sorry to say that I don't see the government and the civil service having the same level of sophistication as actually the military does in terms of understanding itself. And therefore, if the military is the one that has to put forward these things, well, then people in the treasury or the foreign office or FCOD or whatever it is now, you know, all of these places will see it as nothing more than kind of self-aggrandizement and job creation, all the rest, even though, you know, it is legitimately explaining the utility of military power to them. So it's a real vicious circle I see right now in terms of being able to get the most out of what it is that you could practically, uh, practically expect, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, go right. I think what strikes me about looking at my own case study was how much consciousness there was from, you know, from the Cairo embassy right up to Whitehall about how military, you know, military power could be used in that role. So the attaches um, noted, for example, that, um, the, that Egyptian officers who were senior enough to have actually had experience being trained by the British before 1955 actually had some very, were professed to have very fond memories of working uh, with their British counterparts, or certainly they said they preferred them, to, preferred them to the Russians. And so there was a sense that we could actually use these, you know, that we could use training in particular and exchanges between the uh, senior military officers and meetings to actually facilitate this. Looking at it from the cabinet level, one of the things about the, uh, the response that Heath and Douglas Hume take is that Whilst there, obviously there are the complaints coming from the Chiefs of Staff about the potential security implications of selling kits that might be compromised, their attitude is that the bigger picture, the bigger strategic picture of undermining Soviet influence and helping to build up Western influence in a crucial country in the Arab world trumps those concerns. That yes, okay, it may be, there, there may be ways of mitigating this security risk, but their argument is do not be so fixed on our sort of traditional concerns here because we could potentially get a bigger payoff. So there is a strategic rationale for what they're doing. And it's, it's of course of using arms transfers for um, political effects, rather than just thinking, oh, well, it'd be nice to sell, sell some kit and actually get some, that, you, know, um, you know, help boost our exports. Although those concerns are still there. So that, that I think is quite interesting that there is that, there is that you know, sort of the sense that you know what are the what are we trying to achieve here and how can we use this leverage to best effect so in that sense i think that it, this thinking certainly does exist at the time whether it's a difference between generations or um you know, what have you who knows perhaps an, another interesting thing for, here, for me in particular which i think is worth noting is the position of the foreign secretary now 
Douglas Hume had been one of the hawks during the Suez Crisis. As Prime Minister during his brief premiership from 63 to 64, he had overseen covert action in North Yemen directed against the Egyptian occupation force. So even though he had had a, you know, a reputation as an anti nasser hawk, he adjusted very, very quickly to the idea of rapprochement. So much so that, yeah, that, that yeah, it, it, it's quite a striking that it, uh, grasp of his own statecraft in that regard, that whilst he was probably not one of our best prime ministers, although I certainly wouldn't say he's our worst Etonian prime minister, he does have a, a considerable amount of state knowledge of statecraft, which I think stands him in good stead in this regard. That's me, out. I don't know, Poppy, if, uh, if you had any, any opinions on, on any of that, or, or if you um, wanted to further... Would... Sorry, go on. Go on, no, carry on, please. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd agree with a lot of what Garant was saying there, um, that in the, in the Kenyan case, there's always a part of a bigger relationship, and it always fits in with other objectives. Mm. Um, and you can see sometimes this very explicitly. So the, the case that comes to mind is in 1973, when the British, are really, the, the British government as a whole is really worried that Kenya is about to expel the Asian population in the way that Idi Amin had just done in Uganda. And the Kenyans are also at the same time approaching the British uh, in terms of uh, buying arms from them. Mm. And these connections are explicitly raised by the Kenyans and the British in these arms negotiations yes. that the attitude towards arms will affect the attitude, the Kenyan attitude towards their Asian population. And so this, um, the military, the defense engagement side is always, you know, sort of fitting other aims at the same time. It is being thought about in this much wider political context, um, I think in, in the Kenyan case. Brilliant. Uh, we have, I don't know if the, uh, the, the panel can see the question that has been asked. So, uh, in terms of researching defence engagement, is it possible to identify measurable variables? Can you suggest some? Um, do we mean variables or, or metrics? Um, I, I'm not. I'm not quite quite sure on that. But if any of you would like to have a stab at uh, at answering that, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, that's yeah, a good you one. Go. <clears throat> yeah. So I can't see that one actually. Chris, can you read it again? I'm seeing so, the other one. Yeah, Egypt yeah. And so the, the question is, in terms of researching defense engagement, is it possible to identify measurable variables? Can you suggest some? Yeah, so the, uh, one of the measurable variables, I suppose, a very simple one, is whether or not the action has an influence that is measurable through economics. So does it change budget? Does it change the allocation of staff? Does it change the, the way in which uh, things are organized? So there, you know, in that, there are a number of things that you can start to do. And this gets, I mean, one of the things that Geraint and Poppy are talking about, and, and, and actually most of the chapters in this book do talk about, is, is that this is a perception and it is an individual, it is a person to person thing. It's about individual relationships, it's about perceptions of outcomes or perceptions and beliefs of aims, objectives, and also trying, you know, the, the measurable in terms of the actual effect. So if you go to your effects-based doctrine, obviously one of the, you know, one of the problems about effects-based is exactly that. And that's why it fell out of fashion is the whole thing about being able to measure the effect. But I would say that, yes, you can. And I mean, you can measure it in fiscal sense. Do you see budgets or do you say funding D diverted from other things to what it is that you are fixing on. So is it training? Is it staff college spots so that you're getting a higher number of those interactions? Is it, you know, the, the easy one is of course, basic straight up procurement. Did I buy, did I spend billions of pounds? In many of those cases, it's not the military capability, it's the associated political connectivity. And this is one of the reasons why I would argue that there's a lead table for, of course, technology. If you buy American kit, not only do you get best technology, you get American influence or you get American umbrella. If it was from the British, well, you're below. If it's the Germans, you're getting good kit, but you don't come with much political clout. The Russians, the Chinese, you're going to get a lot of kit 
and it might be good, it might be not, but you're not sure just exactly what the political kind of influences that you're going to get in the aftermath of that. So the variables you can measure, but what those variables mean is not as clear. And that is where you really have to start digging into the kinds of things about who's making decisions based on what kind of outcomes, what effects are they trying to do. So it's, it, it is not that easy for in terms of, you know, the, the quantum. Yeah. I mean, there's the, uh, reminds me of the classic quote someone came up with in Vietnam, you know, when you can't measure what's important, you, you take what you can measure and, and make that important. Um, <laughs> Hey, I, Geraint, can I let you answer the next question then, if that's if if yeah. that's right? Is that can I come in quickly with something yeah, yeah, that yeah. talks about yeah talking about this issue of um, how are you measuring effects? Uh, from my side with this subject, one of the things was it was very difficult for um, the attaches in particular to under, you know to sort of get some hold on exactly what they were achieving. The only things that, that were, one thing that was measurable was how their role was changing. So at the start of the period I was, I was discussing, their main role, they're, they're there as intelligence gatherers. Mm. And in particular, they, there are two questions they need to answer. One, are the Egyptians likely to go to war with Israel again? And two, can they get eyes on Soviet kit? And can they get photographs and can they get other forms of technical information from them? By the end of this period, they're saying in their reports that the intelligence angle has vanished, particularly because the Soviets have vanished. But now what's more important is defense engagement, that it's arranging for Egyptian officers to go on British courses, arranging for uh, demonstration teams from British industry to come to um, test it, to, to, sh to show off their kit to the Egyptians to see if they're interested in it. So their role, the fact their role fundamentally changes, although it doesn't provide a quantitative measurement, it is quite important in that regard. But they do miss things. One uh, point is that um, the the war minister, General Ahmed Sadiq, keeps emphasizing the fact that there is a pro-Soviet clique within, still within the Egyptian hierarchy, which is agitating to essentially get back in, in, into the lines with the Soviets. On the 24th of October 1972, Sadat fires him. The British have a bit of a panic about this, particularly the attache team and the defense sales team back in the MOD, and they think, have we missed our opportunity here? Because, you know, has Sadat's firing is this a sign that actually the Egyptians are now going to move back into the Soviet orbit? Is it a missed opportunity for us to develop our ties? And the answer to that question is actually, when it comes down to it, no. So that got fired because he told Sadat that the Egyptian armed forces were not ready to go to war with Israel. And Sadat basically said, well, if you're going to give me that answer, I'm going to appoint somebody who can give me this, uh, that say yes. Because obviously this was part of his strategy leading up to the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War. So it's interesting in that regard is that a certain degree of ethnocentrism crept in here. It's a case of you know, the British said, oh, it, it must be all about us. If the deck's gone, it's us. It's like, no, it's not. It's about Israel. And it's about the preparations for war. Sorry, I, I, I thought that would be interesting. No, no, that's fine. I mean, the, the, the following two questions, in a sense, I think are related. Uh, okay. So, so the first of these is, is the, you know, a, a good point well made. You know, we're, we're discussing you know, 30s, uh, the 60s, the 70s, you know, when Britain's armed forces were, were significantly uh, sized. And so we have a, you know, defence engagement can be conducted as a secondary activity whilst, you know, the bulk of your military is, is directed at facing off the, the Soviets. So, it, whereas nowadays the argument could be that, you know, is, is the defence engagement valuable enough to become a, a, justif a principal justification for our military or, or even for the roles uh, of some particular units. But then that feeds into the, the third question here, uh, Ashley, one of our own, um, which is that the military labour under the delusion that defence engagement is instrument directly instrumental in nature or that it should be that it's about things like upstream capacity building and that in reality all it's about is really keeping doors open what you actually do when you get through the door is immaterial the fact that the door is open is the most important thing and that allows other forms of influence to be pushed through uh, and to work at different levels so i wondered if you had an, uh, are any of you uh, uh, sort of a response to either of those those questions yeah, um, I mean, the point, I think these are all very important points. I mean, one's about um, the idea of, you know, what do you get out of um, these the, uh, defence engagements? I mean, Poppy's point about uh, Nanyuki in Kenya 
think it's quite important because this is one of the, the, the only places you can train in hot savanna terrain uh, if, if, you, if you're British. To be able to do that is useful. To be able to go to Oman to do um, exercise safe Syria is useful because it, you know, it gives you the opportunity to train in a desert environment and find out things about the, um, you know, wh whether your kit has particular problems functioning uh, in that environment where it's been designed uh, for more temperate European climate. Uh, another point that comes out of Operation Orbital in Ukraine is that what I understand is that there's a certain, the, the, sorry, this is with reference to the British Army training team out there, is that this is an opportunity for a two-way process of an exchange of information because the Ukrainians are fighting the Russians and they are learning things about how the Russians fight. And that, of course, is something that is of, of, of interest, uh, certainly from, you know, well, actually from all three services, but from an army perspective in particular. The point about keeping open doors, I think, is very yeah, it, it, it is a very um, relevant, uh, interesting, relevant one. It's actually trying to keep the relationship going. But I think that part of the problem there is that you know, there is the you know, the question of the survivability of that relationship in the long term. I'm reminded very much of what happened with um, the Americans training Iraqi military personnel, particularly training officers, during uh, the occupation of Iraq in, in the northeast. And certainly, when they were, they were, you know, there were uh, Iraqi officers who were showing, who were skilled and showing real promise as good, you know, competent at their job, having non-sectarian attitudes, uh, being focused on the other. They were, you know, had a, a, a sense of national patriotism about them, and they were good at what they did. And the Americans wrote up their reports; they were training them, or they were mentoring them, and then Maliki probably sacked them and replaced them with stumble bums who were just basically, you know, by and large with people who were appointed because of their political loyalty to him rather than their actual competence. So you can, you know, this is ironic because, you know, the, you know, the Americans thought in many respects they were doing these guys a favour by emphasising qualities which to them mattered, which is, can they actually do their job? Whereas Maliki's consideration was, are these people loyal to me? So you can find that the process you know, you, that you will go into a relationship with your own mindset thinking this is what we need to do to establish it and to strengthen it and then that all gets torn apart because of the host nation government and its own attitudes um poppy or greg did you have uh, anything to to say um yeah, I mean, I'd really ag agree with with Ashley's point in the in the questions that um, it's a lot of the time in Kenya, it's about keeping keeping wider doors open, keeping more general influence. And it's often, you know, it, it is aimed at, at certain needs. Um, so the Kenyans need to kind of um, Africanize their military, they need to train up. But it's not always um, very easy to see what what the impact of any of that is, going back to, to this point about what you can measure. Um, one of the, the interesting suggestions that's made about the fact that so many Kenyans are trained in Britain is that this is, is part of a reason why Kenya doesn't have any successful coups. And yet at the same time, there are plenty of British trained officers who lead coups, Idi Amin, for example. Um, so it's very difficult to, to measure what the the actual impact of this training is and a lot of the time I think it is very much just about the wider benefits of the relationship and how it how it fits into that. Brilliant. Greg did you want to did you want to have a go at the final question? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'll do that but I, I just wanted to come back to Ashley's and the one above that uh, the comment that this is when militaries are much far larger the interwar British army is not a much far larger thing so, and even in the Cold War, the whole kind of idea about size and scale, this is particularly if you look pre-1941, any of the activities of the British Army in this regard are, are really worthwhile case studies to be looked at. Um, the question about, you know, Ashley's thing about the open door, this is, and then the, the bottom question about should you have dedicated units, the dedicated unit is called the Foreign Office. It used to understand military power. It used to have people that could have intellectual, theoretical, and actually practical conversations. And indeed, these were the people that were part of, you know, massive amounts of disarmament conferences 
that are on the go or peace conferences, all kinds of these things. And they actually understood the military domain. So I would argue that, you know, the disconnect is, I would argue, in, in this British system today is the fact that the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office is all about trade and commerce and trying to do what you used to do with a board of trade. And it's lost its connectivity to being understanding and cognizant of the fact that diplomacy and statecraft is intimately linked to all types of power and military power is one of those. So I would say that under its present condition, no, the British the MOD should not be having dedicated specialist units that do defense engagement. Actually, what it should be doing is lobbying for the Foreign Office to actually do its job. Uh, the last point would be on then Israel and defense engagement of Israel. The masters of defense engagement, one could argue, given the fact that um, they don't really export and they don't really go places. Uh, this is a very interesting kind of, of uh, way of thinking about this, this uh, defense engagement issue in terms of Israel, which is about demonstration. Uh, about perception management. Certainly it's all about the uh, an information operation element of de defense engagement um, from mythologies of weapon systems, you know, the Iron Dome and the Merkava tank to, you know, the mystique of Mossad. It's because the whole idea about military power is integral to the state and the state understands its relationship very, very clearly in terms of the utility of military power. So, I would argue that actually what you're seeing from the Israeli condition is not defense engagement. It's the utilization of defense across the spectrum, what other, which other countries we would like to emulate. But of course we can't because we're not Israeli. We don't have Israeli governments. We don't have the Israeli national security condition. So the Israeli case, I would argue, you know, has a certain uniqueness that doesn't lend itself or bode make it an easy comparator to what it is that the Western states of the UK or France, Germany, America, Canada style would, would do. And that, that has got to do with the, the nature of the state and its relationship to military power. Sure. Brilliant. So I think, uh, I think we come to the end. A uh, nice bit of validation at the end there from Piotr who'd like, uh, a copy of the, the work uh, to be sent. I'm sure we can arrange that. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you uh, to the participants uh, for their time uh, and effort. And thank you for those of you as well who've uh, tuned in. Hopefully you found it as interesting as I did. Uh, so yeah, and so hopefully success will flower uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of sales uh, and fame and fortune awaits all of you, hopefully. So uh, well done, thank you. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, for Thanks very much to Danny for all the help and Poppy yeah. Green. Thank you both for the chapters and for coming on board with the project and Chris. And thank you all the audience for uh, taking the time to be with us here today. And hopefully we'll do some more of these from, from DSD in the future now that we're all living remote. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Nate. Thanks a lot. Thank you.